This is awkward, isn't it? Go on. You don't need to get stroppy with me. Just because you've been replaced. Can you at least look at me while I'm talking to you? Come on. You've been a good camera, but some cameras just have better colours than you do. Dear. Unbelievable. Honestly. What's going on guys and a warm welcome back to AW Films. I hope you're all doing good. I know I've not posted any videos in quite a while. I've been quite busy with a bunch of different things. Obviously there was the whole Christmas break and the new year. Getting started into the new year. And just been a busy few months quite honestly. Today, more than a comparison, I want to give you guys more my kind of experiences with two different camera brands so that has been the Sony Alpha Line and Canon. Let's start with Sony. I started shooting with Sony about two years ago I'd say. I started on the Sony A6000 as you guys might have seen. Obviously my Instagram sort of logs all of this progress and gives you guys every experience I have, I've had with each of these cameras. So I started on the A6000, that went pretty well. Obviously as I got more into video, more into filmmaking, I wanted to start experimenting, experimenting with flat profiles, log profiles, 4K, that kind of thing, higher bit rates. Obviously my understanding of all of it at that time was pretty minimal, but I did want to try out some more stuff. So further down the line I was shooting with my A6000, and getting some good stills, it was brilliant for stills, good for 1080p video, but I actually went on to ask my uncle, who is also a, a videographer full time, if he would kindly lend me his Sony A7S, which I have right now. And very kindly he did. He gave it to me with, along with the cage, which I actually have here right now as well. And I started playing around with that, shooting some video, and it worked a treat, quite honestly. It was brilliant. I was using it with just adapted lenses. So, interestingly, at this point, I was only using Canon lenses adapted to Sony bodies. And this was, it was quite an interesting thing for me, because obviously this is all sort of manual focus. You have features like the focus peaking on the A7S and other... Sony cameras, which is perfect for manual focus, and I was sort of experimenting around with these. It was looking good, but I just didn't feel like the quality was quite there with the A7S for 1080. I'm fully aware that by attaching a external recorder, uh, something like the Atmos Shogun or uh, Atmos Inferno, Inferno or whatever, you can get far higher quality 4K out of this camera. It's still a brilliant camera high price point on it still, you know, it doesn't depreciate in value. But I felt like I needed something a bit better, something with 4K and still within my budget. So at that point I moved over to the Sony A6300, which you guys, as you know, I've been shooting on for quite a while and up until now was my most recent camera. So I moved over to the A6300, that was a brilliant camera, don't get me wrong, I absolutely loved it. And it showed a lot of promise. It had a lot of promise. All the specs on paper looked awesome. 4K at 100 megabit. <clears throat> Excuse me. 4K at 100 megabit. S Log 3. Generally, a whole range of different coloured modes and picture profiles. And it just made a lot of sense to upgrade to this. And trust me, it was an upgrade from the A7S in terms of specs. Now what can I say about that camera? It was a brilliant camera, but it did have its pitfalls, I've got to say. So, it's a tough one because obviously what Sony have done with that camera is just cram so many of these amazing specs into this tiny little body at a brilliant price point but it just hasn't quite lived up to it, if you see what I mean. Having S-Log3 
in a camera of this size really made a world of difference. But when it came to actual usage of this, it just didn't quite work. There was something about it. I think it's partly because the data transfer rates just are not high enough. 100 megabit in 4K, 50 megabit, 1080. It's just not gonna, it's not enough information being captured to retain all that detail in a log profile and then you can't expect to bring it back in post and retain all those colours and the dynamic range and all the rest of it without having some artefacts basically. So that I was shot in for a little while just because I wanted to get used to it and see what it was like to shoot in log, overexposing my two stops, all that. But yeah, I, I just found my footage at the end of it was just looking appalling quite honestly. And I'm sure you guys could probably agree with me from the footage that I shot in, um, you know, probably in Scotland and a whole bunch of different places, with all, all shot in SL3. So for a while I tried SL2, for a very, very short while, <laughs> I'll stress that, a very short while. SL2 did work better, it did work better. It gave you very similar dynamic range and quite honestly you can't see a lot of difference. It was easier to grade in, po in post, so I did like that. But then I saw more and more posts online talking about Cine 4. Now Cine 4 was by far my favourite pitch profile shooting, and I can say that now. <clears throat> SL3 was great, SL2 was great, but they just didn't quite... Uh, they just didn't quite retain the same quality. Cine 4 still retained some of those colours, it had a base ISO of 200 which made it much easier and you basically just exposed it like a standard Rec 709 profile. So that did make a huge difference. Being able to actually deliberately underexpose shots, overexpose shots if you wanted to for stylistic effects, you know, which I, I didn't often. But just knowing that you could almost, you know, from a glance on the monitor, bring the blacks to crushing but then in post you'll find that there's still some detail in it like that. That made a huge difference. And, you know, quite honestly, that is still my style. That is my style to, you know, bring the blacks almost to crushing and, you know, actually retain more detail in the highlights and mid-tones. But, yeah, generally the camera showed a lot of promise, the A6300. But it just wasn't quite up to what it promised, if you see what I mean. So the 4K, I could never even shoot him. Like, forget that. <clears throat> Just didn't work for me. Obviously, there were a lot of complaints about the overheating issue with the A6300 sensor shooting 4K, which is understandable, but, you know, there's sort of the argument, why put 4K in a camera that can't handle it, if you see what I mean. Also, I think it, I think it was just too high a resolution if you see what I mean because the camera as I mentioned in some of our earliest videos actually downsampled 6k to 4k so <laughs> you know you can't expect a little camera like that to handle that kind of resolution <clears throat> sorry about my voice by the way I don't know what's going on but anyway that was that and it was just something about the camera, I, I don't know what it was. I think the colours, the colours most recently I was shooting in S Gamma 3 Cine colour mode, which did seem a lot better than the kind of pro modes, cinema modes that I was used to shooting in. They, uh, Sony sort of promised that they would, would look more Canon-like, if you see what I mean. But just that statement alone actually made me consider, well, is it better just to switch to Canon? And then I had this in my head, I had it in my head just going round and round thinking, well, okay, Canon don't provide 4K. Canon don't provide flat picture profiles at this price point. But what they 
do provide, they do very well. For example, Canon's colour science is phenomenal, arguably the best or one of the best on the market. The dual pixel autofocus is phenomenal. The codex work very well in post production, very easy to edit and minimal loss of quality when it's sporting. This was the thing and I started to think through all of this and I thought actually, do you know what, for the type of work I do, for the type of videos I shoot, for this kind of video that I shoot right now, it's perfect. Canon would work perfectly. So, one night I had the very spontaneous thought of, oh, do you know what, why don't I just go and pick up a Canon 80D tomorrow? And I, I, was, I was all lying in bed thinking this through. I thought, why don't I just go and pick one up tomorrow? I can trade in all my Sony kit and get a Canon 80D with a flip screen and just a standard wide angle lens, trade in all my Sony stuff, get a decent value for that and just start transferring over to Canon. So I did, I did. I, I mean, call me crazy, but you, as, as I've explained, you guys can kind of see where I'm coming from. The Sony's didn't work for what they promised, despite their specs being a lot more impressive on paper than what Canon had to offer. But that's the trade-off. I suppose you're getting better colour science, better autofocus, a whole bunch of differences really when you think about it, either for good or bad, but also just the ergonomics, the ergonomics of holding a big DSLR, you know, and being able to shoot with it for hours at a time without, you know, any sort of discomfort or, you know, that's another thing that I found with the Sony, was just this tiny little body, I mean, I mean even now, you look at the A7S, and look at look at this grip. Look, I mean it's it's so shallow. Like there, there's barely anything there, do you know what I mean? So how how are you supposed to grip that for hours at a time, you know, when I think about it, you know, on long shoots you're not gonna be gripping something like that and the only way to get around that is to invest in a cage, a top handle, external monitor, you know, <laughs> If you like, just because this screen as well, it doesn't doesn't flip out, doesn't articulate fully. So that was another problem. You know, having this ATD, I can actually watch myself right now. I can compose my shot properly, get me properly in frame, expose properly, and just hit record. It's as easy as that. You know, I shoot right now in a neutral pitch profile because they don't have any. They don't have C log in this camera or anything like that. I know there are um, kind of the Technicolor alternatives, the uh, Cine style, which they provide. But I, I don't know. There's something about installing a third-party profile onto an already fully functional camera that I'm a, a little bit wary of. So I wasn't willing to do that. But yeah, I, I, I'm just loving shooting with this ATD, quite honestly. You guys might notice that the video quality isn't quite as good as the Sony, but I just figured that for this kind of social media, YouTube content creation that I do, this is ideal, really. You know, I, I don't want to be spending hours in post colour correcting, colour grading, you know. I feel like this shot right now, I can see it's got nice contrast, it's got you know, nice colours, nice nice depth to it. Like knife, knife, oh. <laughs> nice depth. And just it generally doesn't look like it needs a lot of work. I mean you know, just to call out a few people, like 
I know that this video has probably been done tons of times by you know different people I, I subscribe to on YouTube and watch regularly Pete McKinnon if you guys haven't watched him you've got to watch him he's a fantastic cinematographer and photographer uh, he shoots with the Canon 1DX Mark II uh, Matty Hipposia, uh the creator of Travel Fields if any of you guys watch him Again, I'll try and put the links to these guys' channels in the description box below, just because they are fantastic. All of them shoot with cannons. He shoots with the Canon 60 Mark II quite often as well. Also, just a whole bunch of other, you know, smaller channels. You know, obviously bigger than mine, but, <laughs> but you know, just, just smaller channels. A lot of people, you know, even professional wedding videographers, uh, just a whole bunch of people that you almost can't make sense of why they're switching from Sony to Canon. But it's because Canon's colours are phenomenal. Canon's 1080 recording is generally very good. I mean, how many of you guys actually watch stuff in 4K? Honestly, true 4K. I mean, alright, some of you may, if you're lucky enough, have 4K TVs and monitors, that sort of thing. But when it comes to post-production, it is so hard to edit 4K. Like, if any of you guys have ever tried it, you've got to try it. Like, unless you have a fast enough processing unit and a fast enough hard drive, it's just... It's a nightmare. It's just constantly sticking, getting stuck, you know, and, oh, it just leaves you doing that. And... No, like, for a camera that can't even shoot 4K without roasting in your hand, like, what's the point, do you know what I mean? What's the point? Why not have a camera with brilliant colours, still excellent dynamic range for the profiles it shoots in, the best autofocus, arguably, in the Canon consumer range right now, check this out. Okay. Now, all I have to do, so say if I want it to focus on my, th my thumb, it's right there. All I have to do is tap the screen. And look at that. Perfect rack focus to my face. And that, that could have passed as being a manual focus. Do you know what I mean? That could have been a manual focus pull. So just for that alone, like Canon just nail this in their DSLRs, I don't know how they do it but it's phenomenal and you know just as far as the stills camera as well, this camera is perfect for stills it barely needs any tweaking in post again it's got the Wi-Fi capabilities, I can transfer raw photos straight from the camera to my phone whack them into Lightroom, do a few minor adjustments and then, you know, straight onto Instagram or whatever, Facebook, you know. It's it's brilliant. And, and it's a no-brainer for me switching to this. I mean, yeah, alright, I might not I might not have the perfect lenses that I need yet for this camera, but at the same time This is working right now. This is working for me. Like for for these types of videos, you know, you've got the zoom on here as well. It's 10 to 18, so that's 18 mil, equivalent to roughly 30 mil on this sensor. By the way, APS-C sensor on the 80D, and 10 mil, equivalent to 16 mil. It's a 1.6 times crop, so that's what you're getting. But again, I've been used to shooting APS-C for a while. And ultimately, one last thing, Canon is the camera that I started with. I don't know if any of you guys remember, but from my earliest photos of me shooting you know, shooting pictures wherever I went, I would carry around this huge, it was the Canon 1DS, 1DS Mark II, not 1DX. <laughs> I wish I had the 1DX and maybe I will do one day, but yeah, the Canon 1DS Mark II. And that was a great camera, really great camera. It didn't shoot video, which was okay for that time because I was so set on photography, you know, I was like, oh, forget video, not interested in video. You know, photography is the way forward, photography is all I want to do. But, 
you know, I started to make that transfer over slowly, you know, and I started to realise the power of video, the messages you can convey with video. I mean, don't get me wrong, photography is incredibly important in video as well because it is, it teaches you about composition, framing, storytelling in a still image, you know, rather than 25 still images per second, 25 frames, you know, or 50 frames. It teaches you about that storytelling and just what it takes in the frame to to really get a message across, if you see what I mean. <clears throat> now, that's not everyone's style, but in terms of video, that is what you need. Video is entirely about storytelling. And in a lot of ways, I felt like the Sony was kind of prohibiting me from doing this. I feel like just due to its ergonomics, it felt so fragile. It just felt like a toy all the time. Like, you know, so tiny, and I, I invested in a cage for it as well. That's more money on extra stuff that really you shouldn't need. And, you know, I mean, I've been recording this video for 21 minutes straight now, and the battery is still fully charged. Like, I, I, it's crazy. Or, or near to full, do you know what I mean? And... I apologise for this video if it does end up being way too long, but it's a bit of a discussion I want to have with you guys, you know, I, I thought for any of you that are interested in it, you know, or perhaps say you're picking up your first uh, first camera, first video camera, and although they're at the same price point, the ATD and the A6300, I would strongly advise actually going with the ATD because I feel that to an extent the 1080p video is better, it's more manageable in post, so if you've got a fairly inexpensive processing unit in your computer, in your laptop, then or a fairly low spec MacBook then it's ideal, quite honestly. As I say, you don't have to know a lot about colour grading or colour correction, quite honestly, because the colours look so good and so accurate straight out of camera. So, in that respect, it's so much easier. But, yeah, I would say, generally, Canon are definitely worth investing in over Sony. Sony's specs are fantastic. Equally, other brands like Panasonic you know, Fujifilm even, Fuji are bringing out a brand new camera, I can't remember what it's called, I think it's the X, X-H1 I think, which also shoots 4K, which do, does it very good on paper again, and I mean I'd say Nikon, Pentax, Olympus are not really worth investing in for video, quite honestly. But, yeah, for what it offers, I'm really impressed with this Canon and I'm loving shooting with it right now. Also, another thing guys, another reason you should choose Canon over Sony, in my opinion, is their lens lineup. Their lens lineup is fantastic. I mean, you know, right now I'm shooting on this 10 to 18. This was 250 for the lens. Compare that to pretty much the same lens from Sony, the 10 to 18 f4, that's about, that's going to run you about 550 quid for the 10 to 18 from Sony, compared to 250. I mean, yeah, for the sake of a slightly faster aperture, is it really worth it? You weigh it up another, what is that? Another 300 quid on top, like, is it worth it? I don't know. Let me know what you guys think. I'm quite interested. How many of you shoot on Canon and love Canon and don't see yourself switching for quite a while? How many of you are fully invested in Sony and just want to keep shooting Sony forever? Or Panasonic, equally? It's an interesting one. And I think it goes to show that 
you know, the perfect camera, the perfect camera, doesn't matter, as they say, you know, it, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it's what suits your needs, what works for you, and ultimately, all that aside, just what you enjoy using, what you enjoy shooting with, what you get the best results out of, and, you know, what doesn't kind of inhibit your creativity, if you see what I mean, like, for me, Sony did that, and with Canon, I just feel like I can create so much more because of the little things, the battery life, the colours, the autofocus, the actual, the fact I've got a headphone jack to listen to audio, which the 6300 just did not, did not have. It's an interesting one. Let me go. Let me know what you guys think. Comment below. I want to know what camera, or in fact, what brand you plan on investing in in the future. What do you think the future looks like for each of these brands? Because <clears throat> although Canon have been quite reserved with their their specs as far as video goes, I do feel like they're about to ramp it up quite soon. Quite soon. We've already seen the 5D Mark IV. It's got 4K and C-Log, which is exciting. You know, I mean, again, it's a lot of money. But I'm hoping, I'm really hoping that at some point they'll bring their prices down a little bit to more of a average consumer kind of market price point. I mean, we're already seeing it with DJI. DJI have already brought the the new Mavic Air down to uh, around seven hundred quid, which is you know very exciting. And definitely, from my perspective, as an average consumer of this sort of thing, it's. You know, it's actually attainable. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's almost like I—I I mean, it's, it's it costs less than this camera. Do you know what I mean? For a drone of of low specifications, like it's it's ideal, really. An ideal price point. The Mavic Pro was over a thousand. So the fact that they're bringing these prices down, and you know, it's, it really is looking very good, very good. And quite honestly, I just can't wait to keep shooting with this Canon. Can't wait to invest in some cheaper lenses, but brilliant lenses at the same time, and just see what I can get with this. <clears throat> Once again, I'm sorry I've been away for so long. I've had a lot on, you know, just and just uh, really just been struggling to find any motivation to shoot anything. But I do love this kind of discussion video. You guys let me know. Also, I'm considering doing some, potentially some live streams as well, so if you guys kind of let me know what kind of time you're online and what time is best for you to tune in, you know, I'd, I'd love to discuss some points about video and just the general uh, market as it is at the moment, you know, all these different products that are coming out and, you know, it's one of the things I love doing best, I love discussing gear and filmmaking in general, different techniques and I just love using that time to kind of share our knowledge with each other, share our experiences. And yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this. I'm sorry it's been super long. I hope you find it helpful. Take care, keep creating, and I'll see you all in the next video.